Welcome back everybody. Today I'm going to be putting an end to the mini series for the basic chat application that I have. So I will be combining the three videos that I did before plus adding additional footage on how to debug the front end and the back end application. Okay guys, here's going to be the chat example that I have. I do have two browsers open where we're going to log into each one as a different user and we're going to just start posting messages and see how the chat feature works. So you can see here I logged in as test user but the actual user's name is John Smith and then this other one is test user 2 and you're going to see here after logging in that the name is Adam Tarley. So you can see in the top there is a message box where you can post your message as part of the chat and then there is the post message button and then there is a text box area where you'll see the chat history so you can see exactly who's typing what. So if I type here ABC on the John Smith uh, you know, browser, you'll see that it's going to be shown up in the message box in both. And as part of the chat, I do post the, the username of each message there, so you can see exactly who wrote what message uh, every single time something is posted. So I'm just going to do a couple more uh, you know, messages here back and forth, so you can see it being reflected in the text box. So you can see how it's working right now. So things look good, and you can see again the username associated to each message and each message being displayed. So let's just go ahead and log out for now. So as mentioned before, this YouTube video is going to be showing how to create a chat application. And so it's going to use a few technologies which I'll go over in the next page. So what this means is that we're going to be doing the following things which is we're going to create an HTML and JavaScript front-end page. We're going to create a Java web application back-end. And we're going to utilize Apache Tomcat server, Keycloak, and PostgreSQL to finish up this website. Okay, so we're going to be utilizing Keycloak to be the user authentication into this chat application. The Apache Tomcat server will be used to serve the HTML Java, uh, JavaScript pages. So we can go to a URL such as HTTP localhost and then the context root and actually see the HTML JavaScript pages. And the Tomcat server is going to launch the Java web application, which is going to talk to the database endpoint. And of course, PostgreSQL will be the database where we're going to be storing the chat information. In. Okay, so the great thing is that I have the code already created that I'll just be copying and pasting so you guys can see instead of me going, you know, typing line by line. But I will try to explain them as much as I can um, so everything makes sense. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, over here we're going to start running Keycloak and we're going to go ahead and set up a new client ID for this application to connect to. So first thing here, I have this uh, endpoint file here which has my database endpoint um, data, so such as the endpoint itself, the port, and the username and password to log in. So you'll have your own endpoint uh, when you create your own database endpoint. So we're going to do this command docker run. And if you notice here, I have the port mapping from 8080 within the container to 8081. And the reason why I have that is because later I'm going to run the Apache client server, or the Apache Tomcat server, and that runs on the 8080 port as well. So there will be a conflict, and both couldn't be run at the same time on the same port. So I changed the key clock to be on 8081 on this local machine. So let the logs just you know, indicate when it's finished. Now let's go ahead into Keycloak website. So again, we're going to do localhost colon 8081. And let's go ahead and create a new chat client app. So here's Realm 1, an existing realm that we have. Click on Create here in Clients and for the client ID, select Chat App. And let's go down here and start entering the redirect URLs. And these are going to be URLs associated with the Apache servers uh, client, or say chat uh, HTML page that we're going to be creating soon. Click Save.
Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and create a database and a table for this chat app. So using the psql command, we're going to go ahead and connect to our existing database. Then let's go ahead and create a database called demo1. And you can see that it's created. And you can see it listed there by doing the backslash t command to see the databases. Now we're going to go ahead and execute this command to give all privileges to the user Postgres to the demo1 database. So now you can see that the access privileges here for that database is now like built as compared to before, there was nothing there. So once again, let's go ahead and connect to the database but directly into the demo1 database. And this time we're going to go ahead and create this table here create table group messages and you can see that I have several columns that's going to be placed in there. One is the you know serial ID for each message which is going to be the primary key and then I'm going to have columns for the username, user ID and the actual message itself. Okay so the great thing is that I have the code already created that I'll just be copying and pasting so you guys can see instead of me going you know typing line by line but I will try to explain them as much as I can um, so everything makes sense. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay guys, let's go ahead and get started with creating the HTML JavaScript code. So go to a folder path where you want to put this and just create an index.html. And for now, we're just going to go ahead and create these basic tags. And let's go ahead and save this. And let's go ahead and open this in an IDE. You can open it in the IDE of your choice but I'm going to do this here in NetBeans, just easier to update. And here we go. So right now the first thing I'm going to do here, and I'm just going to copy and paste it, is I'm going to copy these div IDs, and this is something I copied from another file that I already have with this code. Um, essentially, there's nothing here special other than the fact that these will be replaced by other code that I'm going to create. So this is going to contain dynamically created HTML, which is going to show like user information after they log in and it's going to show the actual form where the user will post their messages in the chat and actually be able to see the message history. Now if we go above here, let's go ahead and create a couple of script sections and just allow me to type this first and then I'll explain what it is. Okay, this first script here, I'm basically loading a Keycloak JavaScript file, which if you look here at my folder, you can see that relative to the index.html, I do have a lib folder, a Keycloak JS adapter distribution, and then a version. And if you look inside here, I do have the Keycloak JavaScript file. And this is important because this is going to allow us to invoke code that's going to allow us to interface with Keycloak for user authentication and for extracting user information. And where you can find this file is if you actually go to the Keycloak website and you go to the downloads folder or downloads page, you can see that there is a, a section called client adapters and there is a JavaScript entry here where you can download it using npm, zip, or targz. So extract, or download it however you prefer, extract the contents, and then you can reference it in your index.html. So that's what that is right there. Now the next section I'm going to do here is something just very basic, not really related to the script function or to say the chat feature, but you know just something I want to do. And you're going to see here in a minute. Okay guys, so as you can see from the comment and from the code, it's pretty simple. I am invoking a timer that's going to be called every second, um, which will then call the function update time, which as you can see here, basically creates a new date object, and we're going to update a div with the local time string. So you can see here, this document get element by ID, it's going to grab this div, time placeholder, and update the contents with this. So as a quick demonstration of this. 
let's go ahead and go into our Apache server and so what we're going to do if you saw my previous videos we're going to do the basically select the context path for this and you got to point the war directory path to the folder where you have this index HTML so if we go here one second and let me just kind of minimize this you'll see that the folder where I have the index HTML is that home Chris documents chat application and then this folder and you can see that correspond to this path here so everything looks good and let's click deploy okay it got successfully deployed so if I go ahead and right click and open this chat you'll see that it's displaying the updated time every single second and that's to be that's as expected because you can see here the set interval is calling update time every second so things are looking good so far now the next thing I want to do is um, let's go ahead and update this body tag because once the page tries to get loaded up we are going to call a specific function this function does not exist just yet but we will have it and essentially you know from the name of if you can tell we're going to create a a function that's going to force the user to authenticate against keycloak and this function is going to initialize some keycloak variables that we need to do just that so let's go ahead and create another script section here and let's do a few things okay first let me just go ahead and copy paste this again from the other file I have so this new script section I'm going to do another set interval which is going to call this get last messages every two seconds this function does not yet exist but I will show you that in a little bit and then you can see here I do have some variables for some app URL endpoints which is going to be useful because this is going to help us interact with different applications for authentication and uh, for example Keycloak for authenticating we're going to have endpoints for um, the Java web application which is going to be where we send requests to get information from the database or to post messages from the database so as you can see here this var apache client endpoint has a value chat and this is going to correlate to the context path that we set our application so you can see here we have forward slash chat this is what that variable is referring to next we have a keycloak based url which is going to be referencing the http localhost 8081 auth and if you look at our keycloak page you can see that the base url path is exactly that localhost 8081 auth next we have an apache tomcat server base url which the base url path is localhost 8080 so if we go to this manager page where we created the the context path for this chat you can see directly here in the url it is localhost 8080 now this variable here is in reference to something that doesn't yet exist we're going to see this in the next video but this is going to be chat this chat web application is going to be the name of the java application that's going to receive these you know requests to post messages to the database or to get the latest chat messages to show to the user and then this here this current app url is essentially the full domain path or should say the full url path for this chat application so you can see here it's going to reference apache tomcat server base url which is localhost 8080 it has a forward slash at the end and then chat which is the the, the context path for this application so so far it's looking good now let's go ahead and create a couple of user variables or just a variable um, that we will use to get user information and these two variables are going to basically contain the, the unique user ID that's stored in Keycloak for this particular user and the username is going to contain as you guessed it the user's username that is stored within Keycloak so let me go ahead and just um, add a comment to this okay so that's 
good. Now we're going to go ahead and create this other variable here, which is messages from DB. And essentially, this is going to contain the list of uh, the, his the chat history to display to the user um, interface. OK, great. So now let me go ahead and paste in the code for the initialize key cloak function here. So I just paste it quite a bit, and I'm going to show you exactly what's happening here. So this initialize key cloak or init key cloak, the first thing it's going to do is create a new key cloak variable, which is going to have the endpoint for key cloak, the realm, and the client that it's trying to connect to. So once again, the key cloak base URL is localhost 8081 auth. And if we go here to the key cloak admin console, you can see again, this is local localhost 8081 auth. And now we're also trying to connect or authenticate against the chat app within the realm one realm. And you can see here, I am in within realm one and within our clients, we do have a chat app. So you can see how this is set up in the part one video of this mini series, but I'll just kind of scroll over this briefly to show you exactly what it is, what I have inputted here. So now if we go back to the code, that defines that variable, and then this key cloak in it basically forces the user to get authenticated. So assuming the user types in the credentials correctly, what's going to happen is we're going to call this generate logged in HTML function which if we see over here, it's going to update two div IDs with one of them is going to say the logged in, you're logged in essentially, and then the second one is going to be a logout link because we have to allow the users to log into the app to also log out. So you can see here that this is the code to do the logout link. And if we scroll down, we're going to see this logged in placeholder and logged out placeholder as div IDs. So here's the logged in placeholder and the logout. So those are going to be updated with this dynamic HTML. Now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a, another key cloak function call called load user info. And here's how we're going to retrieve user information uh, from the key cloak database or the key cloak application. So once we invoke this, we're actually going to extract the subfield, and this is going to contain the unique ID for the user, and then we're going to extract the user's username. So once again, these are going to be used for posting the messages into the database and for retrieving it for showing chat history, because not only do you want to see the messages, you want to see who they came from. So next thing we have here is we have generate user info HTML function call where we pass in a name and an email. And this is simply going to update a div or an ID with display user info placeholder as the name. And it's going to say, welcome within a header one tag. Your email is, and then display the user's email. And you can see that display user info placeholder down below here in the body section. This is going to be updated with that once we get a successful return from key cloak. Now, the last function that's going to be called here is generate message section. HTML and this is probably the most important one because this is going to generate the, the fields for the user to enter a chat message and to show the chat history. So you can see here we are creating a label called message box. We are creating an input field where here's where the user is going to type in their messages to post. We have this input field where the user is going to actually click on to submit the message. And it's going to invoke a submit message Java, a JavaScript call, which doesn't exist just yet, but I will show you in a moment. And then it's going to show a text area field where this is where it's going to display the chat history. So let me go ahead and get the next piece of code. OK, here I'm pasting the submit message function, which again is going to be invoked whenever we hit submit. This is going to take the user input from the message box and send it to the servlet on the Apache Tomcat server. And that server is going to store this message into the database. So you can see here we are creating this URL endpoint. And this is going to contain the endpoint of the Java web application that we didn't create just yet. That will be in the next video. The next thing we're doing is extracting the, what the user typed in from the message box. And you can see that this message box is generated within this function. 
and you can see here this is what the user will type and this is what will be sent whenever the user clicks on post message and then here we're doing a guard check to make sure that that isn't blank if it is we are going to return if it actually contains data we're going to continue on here we're creating a form data object where we're going to be sending three pieces of information the user's ID, the user's name, and the user message. So if you recall, these two were uh, fulfilled when we get the user information back from Keycloak, and then we're going to be, of course, sending the user message that they want to post. Here we're creating you know, HTTP objects to send a post request, which is going to contain the data, as you can see here, see here in the xhr.send. This is going to contain the ID, name, and message to be sent. And this onload function is going to handle the response from the Java web application, which is just going to display whatever the web application displays or returns. And then we're going to go ahead and clear the message box field so the user can type in something else if he wants. Now for the last method, I'm going to go ahead and just start typing it myself. We are going to create the get last messages function. And if you recall, this is actually what's in the second timer that we created. Every two seconds, we are calling this get last messages, which is going to get um, the last few messages from the database to show in the chat history. So let me go ahead and just create a simple comment to indicate such. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is once again create the URL endpoint. And again, this is going to contain the endpoint for the Java web application that doesn't, exi doesn't exist yet, um, but it will. And now let's go ahead and create the variables to submit the GET request. Okay, so this is the code to actually submit the GET request. And here in this onload function we're going to go ahead and handle the data returned so as you can see here we're going to do a json parse on the methods returned because it's going to be sent and you're going to see in the next video it's going to be sent as a json and we're going to assign it to this array or this local variable so let me just add a comment indicating so And now let's extract the fields within it so we can display it on the user's chat area. So we're going to iterate over this because since this is a JSON array, well, it could, it's going to be an array, but it can contain one object or one message, two messages. It depends on how we construct the SQL query to see how much we want to return back. So we're going to go ahead and update this variable to handle or parse out the data okay so you can see this first line is gonna extract the username and the ID from the message back from the web application and I'm gonna do a new line where I then display the message and then simply, I'm going to create this line separator, which is going to uh, separate each chat from the in the chat history box. After this for loop, we're going to go ahead and actually update that text area here. So you can see here, it's going to update an element with the ID called group box with this formatted content. And you can see here, this group box is actually one of those fields dynamically created in this function. You can see this text area has the ID group box. So that's what we're going to do. And that looks like it's about it. So let's do go ahead and do a quick demo to see how this looks like. Let me go ahead and undeploy the chat so we can upload the new HTML file. So we're going to have the same context path and we're going to reference again the folder where this file lives. Okay, looks okay so far. Let's open it up. Once again, it's going to ask for our username. 
So this is just a test user I created, but you can see how the actual name, first name, last name, and it is just this, you know, John Smith, your email is, and then you can see the form here. So this is neat because if you look over here, you can see how the functions in, in the JavaScript code here are actually creating these dynamically. Um, so if we go back up here, you can see that the generate logged in HTML is creating or displaying the logged in text and the logout link. You can see here's the logged in text and here's the logout link that we can actually click. You can see as well we have the generate user info HTML which is actually displaying a welcome username your email is such and you can see that over here welcome user's name um, your email is this and then we have this other generate message section HTML which is actually creating the label the field for it to type in the message to post in the chat the post message button and the text area which you see over here so now something interesting just as an FYI if you right click and select inspect most browsers should have something like this but if you open up the console window you'll notice a bunch of these errors indicating like 404 and basically what that means is um, we're trying to make a request to an endpoint that doesn't exist yet you see how it's trying to call chat web application get latest messages which correlates to these variables here um, chat web application and then we have another function here which uses that plus the gate latest, latest messages since this endpoint doesn't exist and it will in the next video every single two seconds that this message is called we're gonna get this error and so the same thing is going to be true if we try to post a message we should see an error so if I go ahead and just type in something like hello world we're not going to see anything show up in the chat and if you scroll down you'll see that it's trying to do the post message which once again doesn't exist just yet so we get the 404 response and um, yeah so that's it for now guys I mean this is looking okay this is nothing fancy with like CSS I just kinda want to show you the functionality of how to get you know a simple chat application working but as a final test here we can go ahead and test this logout link that we created and you can see we are now back into the login screen um, at which point the user once again can enter their password to log back in and now we're back in so that's it so that concludes this video guys so uh, just to recap part one of the video the previous video that I did basically talks about creating the client ID for this new chat app in Keycloak I also created the database and the table required for these messages to work in this chat application that hasn't really been exercised in this video because the application that will interface to the database is the Java web app which doesn't exist yet but it will so we'll see that in the next video but here I wanted to show just a basic HTML JavaScript to kind of have a chat application working and that's what we did. Okay guys, let's go ahead and start creating the Java web application. So in NetBeans here, I'm just going to click on File, New Project. I have Java with Maven and I'm going to select Web Application. Just give this a project name, I'll just call it chat web application. I have two instances of Apache Tomcat downloaded. I have version 10 and I've named it in there as such. But I'm going to have it run on the other one that I have uh, Apache 9. This is where I have the front end application, the HTML JavaScript, so I'm going to want this to run there so they can interface with each other. So just go ahead and click finish and it's going to generate the project for you. Okay, perfect there it is on the left side you expand that and you expand the project files I'm going to go ahead and update the POM XML so you can see here it comes with one dependency already and this is going to be this is used by the project for like uh, you know servlet requests from you know a front-end app like the HTML JavaScript but we are going to add a couple other dependencies so I'm just going to go ahead so here are the two new dependencies. You can see here I do have a reference to JSON, which I'm going to use a little bit later. 
and I do have a reference to the PostgreSQL uh, dependency. So I copied and pasted it here from another file that I already have with this, but if you wanted to know where I, you would get it, is uh, you can go to the Maven repository here, and I'm already in the JSON page, but uh, you would just type JSON. So let me just go back to the main page here. If I go ahead and type JSON, you'll see that first hit is Google JSON. Go ahead and click on that, and you're going to see the versions that you can use. And you can see the latest is a 2.9.0 that was released earlier this year. You click within here, and you'll have the Maven repository, or to say the dependency that you can use to copy and paste over here, which is exactly what I did. So you could do the same thing for PostgreSQL, and you'll grab the version that you that you would want, and it'll be here. So now we have the POM XML file. Now let's go ahead and create. First, we're going to create a simple Java class here. We're going to call it Message Data. This Java file is not going to have any logic to it. This is just going to have variables that represent the fields in the database. So let me go ahead and get that. Okay, there's sort of the private variables. So let's go ahead and create methods for them. So you can right click on one. You can uh, do a refactor here and do encapsulate fields. And you can actually automatically create the getters and setters for this. So it has by default the first one that you have selected. So if you go ahead and just click the rest and you click refactor, you're going to see that there is a getter method and a setter method for that variable. And they are getters and setters for the other variables that we have created. So I do like having the variables actually defined first and then the methods afterwards. So let's go ahead and just shuffle this around. Great. And let me go ahead and create a public constructor here. And I'm going to have this have four parameters, which are going to correlate to each one of those private variables that we have. And inside here, we're going to go ahead and have the class variable be set to the one passed in in the parameters. So once again, I'm just going to go ahead and update this with what the purpose of this is for. OK, that's that. All right, so now we're going to go ahead and create a couple of other files. But uh, we're going to create the serverless that's going to handle the request from the actual HTML JavaScript pages that we have. So let me go ahead and just create a new package here just to kind of separate the actual ones with logic with just data types like this. So let's go ahead and just call this servlets. Perfect. And now we're going to go ahead and create one of the servlets. And you do right click new. And we're not going to create just a Java class. This time we're going to create a servlet. And here we're going to call this get latest messages. Click on next. And here it's going to ask if you want to add this information to the web XML file. I will actually say yes. I click on the check mark and then click finish. So you'll see this right now. It has some default uh, methods in place. You can see that this message is actually an extension of HTTP servlet since this is a server class. And you can see there's a process request here. And there are methods here to handle a GET request and a POST request, both of which is just going to call the process request method that's up here, which just has some standard boilerplate code where it's going to return just HTML content to be displayed to the front end. And then we have this last one that just says get servlet info where you can just kind of put a description for a servlet. So now one thing to notice is that since we selected to put this in a web XML, if you go ahead and open up web pages, open up web INF, you'll see a web XML. By default, this product is, or this XML file isn't here when you first create the project, but when you go through the process of creating a servlet and you select to have that checkbox checked, then any new server class you create is going to be located here. 
So you can see there is a servlet uh, with the URL pattern, get latest messages. And this is part of the URL string that's used by the front end HTML application. And you see that the servlet name is get latest messages. And then up above here, you can see how get latest messages is then mapped to the servlet class, get latest messages. So here we go. So now let's go ahead and start implementing the, the functionality for this. Okay, I'm going to, again, just for time's sake, I'm going to go ahead and copy this for my other file that I have saved. And a lot of these you see is unused just because we didn't create the code that uses the object just yet. And I do have a failure here, and that's because just the package name path does not correlate to what I have here in this project. And you can see that I updated it to have the right package path com my company chat web application message data and you can see message data is within that same folder hierarchy com my company chat web application so now let's go ahead and start creating the functionality here and what i'm going to do first is actually just delete this because we're not going to be using that and what we're going to do here is we're going to go ahead and define this json array object So you can tell from the name of this, um, this is going to hold the messages returned from the SQL statement that we're going to do in this class, which is going to get the latest messages, which is then going to be shown to the user as the chat history. And you can see here I'm invoking the JSON class um, object here, which is one of the dependencies that we pulled down in our POM XML, if you remember here in the POM. I do have this dependency, JSON, and this is going to be a helper method or a helper class where it's going to help us, you know, parse the object to a, as a JSON object. And then that will be just easier for us to parse in the front end web application. So now let's continue with this. Okay, so you can see here I created another array list. You might be asking why I have a JSON array and an array list here. So initially when we get the information out of the database, I'm going to be posting it into this array. And then using the JSON, I'm going to be able to convert this array list into the JSON's JSON array object type. So let's go ahead and continue here. And we're going to have a try catch block here. And actually, you know, before we even proceed with implementing uh, what I'm going to put here in the try catch, one thing is important to know is that here I'm going to actually extract a connection from the to the database as a JND data source within this web application. If you're not familiar with the JND data sources, uh, let me go ahead and just kind of type it here. So if you look here in the documentation. Um, essentially, you can actually create code to just, you know, uh, connect directly to a database endpoint, right? So you can invoke like a new connection, driver manager dot get connection and specify the URL endpoint and, you know, create a connection that way. But the way I'm going to be doing it here is I'm going to be creating a JND data source, which means instead of having the code explicitly have like the string here within the Java file, I'm going to reference a data source within the Apache Tomcat server. I should say within the web XML and context XML of this app. And it's going to have the information, the endpoint information there. So then I can create a connection that way. So it'll make a little bit more sense in a moment. So let me go ahead and, uh, you know, just start doing that right now. So first things first, I'm going to go ahead and open up the context XML file. You'll see it. We have this here, context path chat web application. And I'm going to update this to be this. Uh, so something again that I copy and pasted from another file that I have. But you'll see here that it has the context path. And you'll see that this is an extra set of data. And this is going to be used to actually, um, oh, let me get rid of this duplicate here. This is going to be used by the app to reference the Jindy data source to get the endpoint to the database. So you'll see here there's a bunch of fields and more importantly, 
I have a couple of fields blank for now just for you know hiding the database endpoint but you're gonna have a URL where you're gonna have the endpoint of the database you're gonna have the username for which to connect to and then the password that you would use to connect to the database so once again if we go to the JinD data source how to for Apache Tomcat server there's gonna have explanations here on how to connect to the database using JinD data source and they do actually have uh, examples for each type of database so here's for MySQL um, down below we have Oracle and we are using a PostgreSQL database so we over here at the PostgreSQL section you'll see that they have references to what you need to do and if you look here under 2B there is a reference to the context XML and that you need to update it to have this so if you remember right the URL that I had was blank in mines but you're gonna actually update it to have the endpoint that you see well not here but you're gonna have the endpoint that you have so if it's running on your local host you would put JDBC PostgreSQL and then you know 127.0.0.1 and then the default port for PostgreSQL is 5432 you specify the exact database and that's it what that's all you have to do with the context XML but in addition to that you do have to update the web XML and if you'll notice here there is a uh, ref reference name here that's JDBC Postgres and notice that that actually matches up with the reference name that is over here so if you look at the resource name it's JDC, JDBC Postgres notice here the reference name is the same so they do have to match up so let's go back to our web XML and let's add that to ours okay here is our resource refs referencing this JDBC Postgres reference or resource and that's going to be defined in here okay so now that we have that um, we're going to go back to the code and actually start updating this to have to get the JinD data source and uh, connect to the database and just as an FYI what I'm going to do here is once again inside this Apache Tomcat server documentation you can see that at least within the PostgreSQL section there is a section saying accessing the database and you can see here it creates an initial context object creates a data source and it looks up the JDBC data source and doing this essentially you can get a connection to the database so let's go ahead and start doing that here You'll notice here that this lookup actually has Java, colon, comp, env. Um, that's just the standard uh, for how you actually would, uh, you know, put in here in this context lookup. But you can see that this second part here is what is going to correlate this lookup to the resource that we defined in the web XML. You can see it's JDBC Postgres and also the context XML, which also has the name JDBC Postgres. So from here, let's just go to the next line. And you can see here, we're actually gonna get a connection. And we're gonna be setting that to the connection object that we defined up above. Now that we have a connection, we can actually create a statement object, and this is going to be used to help uh, execute a SQL query that we're going to do in the database. And let's create the string here, which is actually going to con contain the SQL statement that we're going to do in the database. So what we're going to do is uh, select star. We want everything from the group messages table. And we're going to invoke this order by clause, which basically is saying um, we want to get basically the latest two messages that we that's posted in the database. And well, as I just said, we're going to get two. So I have order by message ID and descending order and limit two. So we just want two, and we want to get the latest ones. So we don't want the first ones to show up in the chat history. We want to show just the latest two, 
and then if we wanted to we can make changes to the HTML to actually be able to scroll back up and then force the app to you know get the older data from the database but for now we just want to show the latest two so we have the query there and now we can actually execute this query and we're going to do this as follows We are going to invoke this execute query statement on the statement object and we're going to pass in the SQL query that we just created right now as a parameter. And the result is going to be set to this result set object called RS. So now we can go ahead and start parsing out the data. And now we're going to use that message data object that we created before. We're going to create a new instance of it. And we're going to pass in it the four parameters that we created in the constructor for it. Oh, hold on. Got that extra S there. And we're going to add that to the data array list that we have. And that's that. So here we're going to go ahead and call this collections dot reverse, which from the name of it, as you can tell, is just going to reverse the latest two. Uh, or should I say, reverse the order of the uh, data fields in this data array. And then now we're going to go ahead and assign the messages array, which is of type JSON array. And we're going to use JSON to basically convert this array list into this JSON array. So let's do messages array. Okay, great. So, so far, so good. That's all we need up here in the catch block. Let's just go ahead and just log the error or the exception. And then we're going to have a finally block where we're going to close out the resources. So we're going to close out the connection objects. So we're going to do a quick check to see if it's not null. So if it's not null, that means we actually created a database connection to it. And then we're going to do con.close. This is going to throw a potential exception. So let's go ahead and right left click here and just select surround demo try catch. So that case it's handled and then after this catch we're just going to go ahead and null the object and then here we're going to go to the last try catch here with the print writer out and here's where we're going to return the JSON array that we just created above so we're going to do print line and we're going to just simply pass in messages array and this is going to be returned back to the HTML JavaScript file that we have so now we should be able to compile this. So let's go ahead and do that. Oops, something is missing here. Let me see one second what this could be. Okay, it's complaining about the Maven War plugin 2.3. Let's go here. Here's a 2.3 version. Let's see if we can try a newer one that exists so there is a 3.3.2 save it let's do a clean and build okay build now all right now that we have to get latest messages in place let's go ahead and create the other server that we're gonna that we need which is going to handle receiving the post message requests from the html application so let's go here and in the servers package, let's right click new servlet and let's go ahead and call this post message servlet. Click next. Click this checkbox to add the information to the web XML and click finish. So here we go. Just like with get latest messages, since this is a servlet, 
it's going to have some code already in here by default, which, for example, one is it one is of it extending HTTP servlet. We have this process request, and we have just again this stuff that comes with the a servlet, the do get the do get method, and the do post method, and a get servlet info. So let's go ahead and start creating the code needed for this. Okay, first things first, I'm going to go ahead and just copy all the imports that I need. Once again, they are unused right now, but once I create the code here, you're going to see how this is going to be used and no longer be unused, I should say. So first, we're going to create a, a few class variables. Okay, so this is going to be useful for us because this is going to help us parse out the data from the actual um, front-end application. So if I go here one second, and let me just kind of go back, and let's go to here. I'm sorry, not here. I'm going to go into this folder, and let's go ahead and open up the index.html. If you recall, I'll scroll down here. When we post a message, we are creating this data form object or form data object. And you can see here that uh, the, the key is user ID and the value is the actual user ID. Then you can see the key, you know, username and user message. And so you can see here I have these variables that correlate to that. And these are going to be used to help us parse out the data receipt from the front-end application. So that's what that is. Now let's go ahead and create a few other variables. Okay, I created these three variables which looks like they're the same as the above minus the fact that they're not final and they're not capitalized. But this is going to help use uh, help us determine when to start parsing out the user, you know, specific fields. And this is going to actually contain the values. So I'm just going to go ahead and just make that comment to reflect that. Okay. And so for each post message, you know, we're going to associate the ID and the name of the user that posted it. And you can see we have obviously the message that will be posted. And this is also used by the gate latest messages where it's going to extract this data as well. Um, so we have the variables that we want here. So let's go ahead and actually start creating the code. So in the process request, we're going to do just like in the other server, we're going to just take this code out. And what we're going to do first is actually we're going to create a new method here called private boolean handle message. And for its Parameters, we're just going to simply pass in the same two that are also part of process requests. And it's a Boolean, so it's expecting to return something. Um, so we will do that shortly. But for now, let's go ahead and go back up here. We're going to create a Boolean status variable. And it's simply going to take the response from this or the return value from this. And in this class here, or to say in this try catch, what we're going to do is simply return that. So we're going to do out dot print line, and we're going to just put the string statement here. Okay, so not too much context here right now, but all of the the code, the heavy lifting of this server is going to be done in this method here. So let's just create a comment here, just indicating that this is going to post the user's messages to the database. All right, so let's go to the next part of this method. Okay, so once again, I'm copying and pasting this from another Java file that I have. And this is basically going to be extracting the user data from the front end. So I'm getting a get reader object from the request object. And here I'm parsing out or reading in everything that was sent from the front end. 
So you can see here I'm doing a while loop where I'm checking to make sure that we don't reach the end. So while reader.readline not equals null. And I'm checking to see if the specific line has the user ID um, key. This is going to let me know that the next line, or a couple lines, is going to have the value so I can go ahead and assign that. I do the same thing with the user message and the user name. And I'm going to demo this afterwards, but essentially in each one of these cases, I do the same thing. I basically read ahead. I call reader.readline a couple of times because in the response, or should say in the data that is received, the value is actually two lines after like the key. So that's what I'm reading ahead two times. And then I just simply display another variable message, which is going to read all the lines in and display it here. So it'll make more sense when we demo this. But now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and create code to do the actual insert into the database. So let's go ahead and create a Boolean status variable. We're going to default it to false. This is what's going to be returned in the end. And let's go ahead and create another try catch block. And here we're just going to simply just print the exception. And here we're going to do the exact same thing that we did in the other servlet, where we're going to create a connection to the database, but instead of doing a select query, we're going to do an insert command. So for the first part, let me go ahead and just copy what I have and get latest messages, which is these three lines here where I'm creating a new initial context object and then using that to do a lookup to get a reference to the GND data source and then actually getting a connection from that. So let's go here in a try catch and paste that. So looks good. And over here, what we're going to do, now we're going to create a prepared statement. And we're going to be invoking this prepare statement from the connection object itself. And here we're going to do the insert command. So we're going to do insert into group, now let me spell this correctly, into group messages, which is the name of the database table that we created. And we're going to specify the columns that we want to insert into. So I'm listing them out here. And then we're going to type in values and we're going to put three question marks and the reason why we're doing three question marks and this is basically a tactic to um, eliminate SQL injection that can happen into your application and if you don't know SQL injection is basically a way for hackers to actually invoke involuntary SQL commands into your database which can be very dangerous because they can extract a bunch of information including deleting and dropping every information that you have stored there so we do not want that and that is the purpose of a prepared statement and the reason why we didn't do a prepared statement in the get latest messages is because we're not inserting anything into the database we're simply getting a we're doing a performing a select query so there's nothing that is passed in from the user here where they could put in malicious uh, you know sequence of characters that could execute you know SQL code that you do not want but since we are putting the user ID username and messages and messages is the real only real thing that the user enters that they could put you know you know bad SQL text together to execute stuff that you do not want to have executed um, because that is something that's entered by the user we want to protect the app which is why we do a pre prepared statement so the way you actually put the data into this is by doing the next few commands you'll see here what I'm doing is I'm actually now retroactively uh, backfilling the question mark with the value so I'm doing set string and you can see the value is one and this is basically referring to the first question mark here and I am assigning it to be the user ID value and if you see here it's important to note this when the insert command group messages is you know constructed you can see here in the 
parentheses, that user ID is the first thing in the list, which means the first question mark, the first column here, we want to put the user ID. So the next one is username. So if we do set string with column two, we're going to have to put the username there because that's what the column expects. So let me just copy that one second. And I'll just replace user ID with user message. I'm sorry, username. And then let me update this column to be the second one. And then, of course, the third question mark correlates to this third field, which is the actual message. And this is the one that could cause the most you know, danger to your application if you didn't protect against it. But we are protecting against it here, so we are safe. And I believe this is called just user message, so let's go ahead and copy and paste that there. Perfect. So now, now that that's done, we're going to go ahead and basically call the execute command on the p statement object. So the prepared statement, we're going to do execute. And this does return a Boolean. Let's see if I can actually show the Java docs to this. See if it'll come up. If it doesn't, it's fine. But uh, this can return, you know, one of several things, you know, Boolean true or false, or um, I forget another object. I think it's a result set. So depending on the query you do, this can return a result set. But for insert commands, it won't. Um, so it's going to be returning a Boolean. So this is going to return it here. And then we're going to just basically return that back to the user. So let's go ahead and clean and build this. So I think what we have now is pretty much the Java code that we need for this whole application to start working. Alright, things are looking good. So actually one thing that we need to do before we run this, and when I say run, we're going to essentially launch this as a Java web application. What we need to do is put the Postgres SQL library within the Apache server itself. Because it, recall, once again, we are getting this as a Jindy data source for basically, basically like database connection pooling uh, with through Apache Tomcat server. So the Apache Tomcat server has to have a reference to the basically driver manager uh, for the database endpoint that you have. So if we go, let me go to my folder where I have Apache Tomcat server. So there's Apache 9. If you go to the lib folder, okay, great. It looks like I already have it. But by default, when you first you know install Apache Tomcat server, at least this version, this doesn't have the Postgres SQL jar. So this is something you have to basically copy and paste into here and then just restart your server if it's not already started or if it started already. So I have it here, which is good which means now we can actually go ahead and run this application. And this is going to force Apache Tomcat server to start up. And you can see there is indications here that it's deploying this application. Uh -huh, it's acting, asking for our credentials for the Apache Tomcat server. Perfect. Um, you'll see that it's displaying this hello world in chat web application. You can ignore this. This is something um, if you notice here, chat web application, there's an index HTML file. Um, the user is not going to have access to this. So, you know, this is something you can kind of ignore. Or you can even delete this, I believe, and there's no issues there. Um, the front end to this app is the other HTML JavaScript file that we have created. So aside from that, let me double check something else. Okay. What I'm going to do here is restart the key cloak instance that I have here. And the reason why this is important is because to really test out the back end, we need to have the user interaction on the front end. And the HTML JavaScript application that we have needs key cloak to authenticate against. So that's why I am starting up key cloak right now. And while that's starting up, let's go here to the services tab, open up servers, open up the Tomcat version that we have running. 
looks like I have the old one running as well, or should I say the new one. So let's stop the new one because I'm not, I don't care about Tomcat 10 at the moment. I am running this application within Tomcat 9. Let's open up the manager. Oh, let's see here. Aha. Let's see. Okay, maybe when I stop the newer one, I accidentally stop this one here. Or maybe it was just confused that I had two Apache Tomcat servers running. So let me go ahead and just stop this one since I stopped the other one. And let's just start over. It looked like I had this other one already running. So it might have got confused and that's why I couldn't access the local manager page. But just as an FYI, uh, Keycloak did fully initialize as you can see here. And you can see that now I can go to localhost 8081 auth page. And from here, you know, I can just log in if I wanted to. Um, but let's go back here. And now that both are stopped, let me go ahead and launch the old one. Not necessarily old. It's Apache Tomcat 9, which is still very good. One of the newest ones. But old in the context that I have a newer one ten here. Okay, so it looks like it started up just fine. So let's go ahead and go down here, open in browser. Perfect, it's acting for my credentials. Okay, great. I am here now. Now if you notice, we have the chat web application here, which is looking good. And yeah, everything should be running now. So let me just make sure that, okay, yeah, I think this is running fine. So now let me go ahead and yeah, let me go ahead and actually launch the chat app. So let me just right click, open up this. It's forcing me to sign in. So now if I do test user, type the credentials, I log in. I'm logged in now. And you notice here actually something interesting is that I do have text chat history here in the chat history dialog box. Now you might be wondering why, because I didn't type anything just yet. And the reason why is because I did actually play around with this before and did have some test messages going on within the database itself. But uh, you can see here, I can type something else new right over here. And uh, let's just say this. Hey there. And I post a message. And there it is. You can see that the post message query worked because now the get latest message Actually, the post message insert command worked because the get latest messages query came back with that same message. And if you remember in my previous video, when I did an inspect here, we saw a bunch of four or fours happening in the console log. And that's because, you know, the endpoints that the front end app was trying to connect to uh, didn't exist because this application was not there yet. So let me go ahead and open up Chrome. The chat's not really fun if no one else is in the chat. So I'm going to open up another browser and I'm going to launch this application. So I'm going to copy this URL. Okay, so now let's type that in and it's going to bring me to the login page. And so let me go ahead and log in with the other user that I have, the other test user. And you can see here, welcome John Smith for the first dialog, but or to say in the Firefox browser, but in the Chrome that I just created or opened up, since I logged in as user two, that actually has the name Adam Tarley. And then look here, see the chat history, it shows the exact same things. So you can see here that John Smith, who has the username test user, um, wrote the hey there message. And you can see in this other chat with this other user, you can see that hey there message with the user's username. This ID is not necessarily important to put here. You know, I could have done without that. But let me just go ahead and type here, hello. You'll see that you can see the hello over here and that's being reflected in both. So once again, uh, 
we have two queries or two messages coming back and that's only because if you recall in the get latest messages we do have this select command which is basically limiting the number of responses to be two so if I go ahead and you know update this to be four and let me go ahead and recompile and like run it which will force it to be redeployed we're gonna see what happens afterwards Okay, so let's go ahead and let's make sure that it's pointing to the... Okay, this is the old servlet, version 9, not version 10, so that's good. So let's go ahead and run this. Okay, that's how we know that it got relaunched fine, because it brings up the index HTML that's part of this app. But uh, we don't care about that. So now if you look here, now you can see more messages actually. So you see what are you doing later? I'm going out to eat and you can see the latest two that we typed. And so if I go to the other browser uh, in Chrome you'll see the same thing happening. Because since that get latest request is happening every couple of seconds it automatically go, uh, got the, the you know four messages and came back. So one improvement we can do here is have like the scroll feature work a little bit better automatically bring it down to the bottom because you notice when it first came up that it was showing the oldest of the messages so there's more messages than four in the database table but in this particular chat we're returning four and you can see it's showing the first three so maybe we can just expand that dialog there since it's adjustable maybe that's okay for now but you know that's a feature update we can do where we just make this automatically go to the bottom so you can see here, let me just type in this message. You can see Java is fun. Java is fun. And let's go ahead and be like, hell yeah, it is. Not too sure how many people actually say that, but you know, let's go ahead and just pretend somebody does. So things are looking good. This is great. So we can go ahead and just do a quick logout here just so you can verify that the logout feature works. And now one thing I think would be great to do is for us to actually debug the application. So let's go ahead and not here just yet, but actually let's do it on the front end here. Uh, let me re-log in. and right click on the browser select inspect you'll see a bunch of tabs here but the one we're interested in is in a debugger tab and if you go ahead and open this up index html uh, here's where it should be if this happens where it says error incorrect contents fetch please reload just simply reload the page you may have to go back to that file here and now you can see the html javascript code that we actually created so you know, if we start with the first thing, the update timer here, if we put a breakpoint here, you'll see that this is getting hit. You can see the date object being hit. We're creating a new date object and we're updating this, you know, placeholder HTML with this value. So you can see that, you know, this gets hit frequently because again, this is called every two seconds. So that's that. More importantly, uh, let's go to the get, get latest messages or there's a little bit more fun in here you can see here again this is happening every two seconds and we're constructing this URL endpoint which is localhost to 8080 chat web application get latest messages so what's important here to realize is that again if we go to the Apache Tomcat server you can see localhost 8080 and then if you actually follow the context path to be localhost 8084 slash chat web app chat web application and then of course in the web xml here you can see that we have the get latest messages here right at the end of the url endpoint and that translates that request and basically says get latest messages is going to be the server that's going to handle that response so if we go back over here let's go back to the code it's going to send this get request there and it's going to send it as a this XML HTTP request. So let's put a breakpoint in here because that's 
going to come back on a separate thread. And you can see here, I already got in here, which means I got a response back from the database. And if we step over, you can see that we have four, an index array of four, and that correlates to the number of uh, queries, we're, or should I say, um, messages we're getting back from the chat history. If you remember, select query, we select to have four. And you can see each index is a different message, which is exactly what we want. And then here we just go to this for loop where we format it just to kind of have the user ID, the username, and have this, you know, line separator between each of the messages. And then we go ahead and update group box with that value. And if you remember, group box is dynamically created up here, and that's the text area field that you see. So we can just kind of click on that. It's going to go through, and you see this being updated here. So that's looking great. Now the last thing here, uh, at least on this front end application, is the post message, right? So let's go ahead to that post message. So here it is, submit message. And we're going to put a breakpoint there. And let's go ahead and just type the word test, select post message. And you can see here we're creating this you know, URL endpoint, which is essentially the same as the other one because it's the same web app that's going to be on the same server, so localhost 8080 chat web application. But the endpoint is post message servlet, not get latest messages. So another servlet is going to be handling this. So now we're going to go ahead and extract the contents from the message box field, which is just simply test. Here we're going to go through this guard to make sure that the user entered something. And now you can see here the form data object being created and we are populating it with the user ID, username from Keycloak, both of these are from Keycloak, and the user message is actually from the text uh, front end over here. So that's looking good. Here we have the, ex, you know, the, the code to create the post request, and then here we actually send the request, and here we clean up, clear up the data field. So if we do just play, you can see, scroll down, here's test, and yeah, things are looking good. So I think the front end looks great when it comes to debugging. Now let's go ahead and debug the back end so you can kind of see how things work in a more clear sense. So let's just right, uh, go to the Projects tab, right click, click Debug. It's going to relaunch it. So we're going to see that index.html, this here, uh, be, be launched on the browser, which we can ignore. There it is, ignored. Now let's go ahead and put a breakpoint and get latest messages, because again, this happens every couple of seconds automatically. Put a breakpoint here. Oh, you can see it got hit. So let's scroll through. Here, again, we're retrieving a database connection using the Jindy data source. If you recall, I had the fields there blanked out, but I do have them properly filled in now. So you would just replace those you know, URL endpoint fields and the password with what you have for your database. Here it's going to get a connection from that data source and it succeeded. I'm creating the, a statement object and then here's the SQL statement that's going to be constructed. And then here it's going to actually execute that query. It returned back and here we're going to be just parsing out the result set data. And you can see here I'm extracting each field from this group messages table. And so if we look at this message data array specifically or object, you'll see that you know we have message ID which is not displayed on the front end. This is a unique ID for each message, but that's not something we display on the front end page. We have the actual message, the user's unique key cloak ID, and the user's username. So we add that to this data array. Um, I don't want to see the other three, or we don't need to debug the other three, but you can see once we get out of this loop, we have this data array that's of four, size four. Here we're going to reverse the array, the, the contents in there, so we can display it correctly on the front end. And then here we're going to convert this array list to this message array, which is a JSON array from the JSON uh, dependency in the pound file. So you can see it's null, but once we pass this, we can see that this now contains a JSON representation of the, of the data. And this is 
useful because it makes it easier to parse on the front end. So if we go back to the code here and the index HTML, if we go to the get latest messages, you can see here how we have a JSON parse on the uh, the response, the return data. This would not work if we didn't have this file here returning this array list as a JSON array object. So that's very useful. Um, it makes it easier to parse out. So once again, you know, once we convert this to, you know, this message, once we assign a JSON object to this and if, if it's in the case of an array list we can extract the user fields just by typing in the user uh, the field itself so usernames a field within this JSON object user ID message and that's exactly the spelling and casing as this message data array object you can see message our user ID username message so that's how they link together um, so if we just kind of continue with this we're in the finally block, just closing out the connection, and then here we just return the array back. And you can see here it hits here automatically again because this happens every two seconds automatically. So let me just take away the breakpoints here, and you can see how that's working appropriately. Now let's put a breakpoint in this post message, and let's go ahead and type in another test message. Test part two. Alright, you can see how we got to this post message servlet because again the index HTML and JavaScript sends a request to the post message servlet URL. So let's go ahead and step into this. We are getting a reader from the request object and here's where it contains um, the data that was sent from the user. So we're going to quickly step or skip this. I'm going to put a breakpoint here and the reason why is because I want you to see this message or this print statement which is going to print out all the content read in from here. So if we do this uh, just hit that you're going to see this here. And so I guess what's important to know is that you remember we have a line that we're checking to see if user ID is there. And you can see that this line does have user ID here. And then we do a couple of read lines, which is basically getting ahead. And then once the value, so this is the key clock ID associated to the user. So once we are on the second line after the, the key is found, then we know that that's where the value is and we can assign it there. So same thing with this look here. So that's user ID. Here's username. And you can see here the actual username is two lines below. So I do two read lines and then I know that the next one, the set, that line basically is the user ID. And then same thing with this here. Here's a user message. So we're looking for user message. And then we're reading ahead a couple of lines. And you can see that here's the actual value for that. So that's why we have this code as such just to parse it out correctly. And now that we're here, we're in the code that's going to be creating the database connection and doing the insert statement. So let's go ahead and get a connection again from this context lookup. We are creating this insert statement, prepared statement I should say, and then we're back filling those values with the user ID, username, and user message and calling execute. And then we're just simply returning the boolean status and oh, I did F7 into a little bit too far, so let's just kind of skip out of that. And things are working fine. So you can go back here to the HTML and or the front end, you can see test part two, which is the last message I just sent. So this is basically the chat application working right now as um, I was discussing. It is a very simple chat application. Of course, there's no CSS styling here, so we could make it look better. And we could also implement features where that, where basically you have to add a user to be part of your chat group. Right now, anybody who goes to like, you know, localhost 8080 chat, so if I open up different browsers and go there, they're all gonna be connected to the same chat, but a chat feature is probably more useful if you think about like Facebook messaging or 
WhatsApp messaging, you can create a select group of like two users, three users, or 10 users, and each one will have their own chat history. So we could do something like that, but this is just, you know, a, in a simple example of just how to get something like this working using HTML, JavaScript, Java web applications, Apache Tomcat server, Keycloak, and PostgreSQL database, which is going to be, which was used here for, you know, storing the messages here. Okay, guys, that's it. Thank you for watching this video tutorial. Uh, if it was helpful to you, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And you can follow me also on different social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon. So just once again, thank you for watching, and I will see you next time.